Let's switch gears for a minute and talk about a little powered speaker called the Atom Audio D3V. These were loaned to me by the manufacturer and they retail for about $299 per pair. This is an itty bitty little desktop speaker, not meant for high output and not necessarily meant for far field listening, but at maybe about a meter away or so, this thing is pretty awesome. It gets down to about 50 Hertz without issue, but once it gets down to 50 Hertz, then it goes and just falls off like a brick. So if you want low, low frequency bass, you're gonna to need to complement this with a subwoofer. This is a power speaker, so it has all that stuff taken care of. You just plug your source up and then you are set. So it's got a USB-C on the back and a couple analogs as well. It also features what I think is really cool. It has some settings up here that you can adjust and I'll show you a close up. If you look on the back, you can see some options on how to set the speaker up. You've got your position, desk and room settings here. Then you've got your digital audio input and you have a set of balanced analog inputs. And on the back of the speaker, there's a little cable that runs from your main speaker to the secondary speaker. So you don't have to have two power plug outlets. You just need the one. My overall impression of the speaker is, it is a fantastic, fantastic desktop speaker. And the different settings that you can play around with to get the overall sound the way you need it to be, maybe depending on the room, maybe depending on where you place it, like on a desk or near a wall, those are great features to have. For $299 per pair, it's gonna be really, really hard to find anything that's better. And for goodness sakes, if you're looking for a desktop speaker on a budget, please do not buy those cheap $100 ones because most of them are garbage, especially if they're compact. Save up a little bit of extra money and either buy this or you can buy something like the Cali LP UNF that I'll be talking about in a little bit as well for comparison purposes. On the front, you'll see the woofer and then you'll see the tweeter up here, but on the sides are little passive radiators. Now that allows you to get a little bit more bass extension out of this speaker. This speaker is nominally flat, which means that when it's pointed directly at you in an anechoic chamber, it's gonna be completely flat. If you set it on a desk, if you set it near a wall, if you put it in a corner, if you put it on a stand, et cetera, et cetera, that's what these guys on the back are meant for. So you can tweak the sound to be better suited for your particular environment. In my case, I had these on stands behind my monitors, high enough to where they're not shooting directly into my monitors. And I've used them for mixing a couple videos so far, and I really like them. Like I said, they are not necessarily meant for far field listening. So if you're more than maybe a meter or so away, just be mindful that you're gonna reach the limits of this speaker. It's got a built-in limiter that's going to chop off the lower frequency content and actually the mid-range content as well, which we will see in the data shortly. Now, speaking of the data, before I get into that, what I wanna do is play you a sound clip of this speaker overlaid on top of some pink noise. So we're gonna start this off with playing some pink noise, the original pink noise, full band, 20 hertz, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Then we're gonna take the impulse response acquired from the anechoic measurements of the speaker. We're gonna convolve that into the pink noise and you're going to be able to tell what difference this speaker makes to the original signal. And you'll probably notice that it's gonna be very hard to tell other than just like the lower bass, which is a given. So with that said, let's go ahead and kick that off. What did you hear? Did you hear anything? Did anything sound completely different or did it sound pretty dang similar and maybe practically indistinguishable from the original pink noise? So let's see what you heard. This is the frequency response of this speaker. It extends flat down to about 50 Hertz or so, and then it rolls off quickly. Above 50 Hertz, you're looking at the overall response linearity of the speaker being within about plus or minus two decibels, which is really good. Now, the only area that might kind of stand out to you if you've got a really good ear is this four to six kilohertz area right here and beyond. It may sound a little bit tipped up on the top end. Then if we switch over to the CEA 2034 data set, we can get a better idea of the overall directivity of the speaker. Now, this is very important to understand. This set of data, the CEA 2034 data set, is intended to provide you a lot of metrics about a speaker, but it's not necessarily driven toward the metrics of a near-field monitor. 
The difference being the near field monitor, you're so close to the speaker that the effects of the room are pretty much mitigated. That being said, here is that data for those of you who are interested. Just keep in mind that it's not really as useful for near field listening, okay? Same thing for estimated in-room response. If I were listening to the speaker far away, I would notice a bump in the top end. The same thing that that on-axis response showed us, but it would be more severe the further you are away from the speaker and the more reflections are accounted for in your listening position. But when you're listening directly to the speaker on axis in the near field, you're pretty much gonna get this response in black, maybe a little bit of the green, depending on if you're not directly on axis in line with that tweeter. Okay. Same kind of story here, the radiation of the speaker, the further you get away, the more it matters, the closer you are, the less it matters. But for those of you who are interested, this is the horizontal contour, which basically shows us that the speaker's contour is really quite good. You see a little bit of a deviation through this mid-range right here, and then it broadens again at around 4K or so. This is gonna be responsible for that bright sound you hear in the far field, less so in the near field. But what about vertical? Now this one to me is really important to understand because even if you're listening in the near field, you need to know where to put your ears at, okay? So when you're listening in the near field, it's more of a consequence if you're above or below the reference axis. The reference axis in this particular case, at least according to the data, is directly at the tweeter. If you go below or above this tweeter line too much and start entering these areas where you're outside of the dark red, you're gonna hear less of the originally intended sound. What about output capability? Normally I don't show this graphic, which is 76 decibels harmonic distortion, but given that this speaker isn't intended to go crazy loud or listen to from far away, this, this is helpful, I think, to kind of show you the overall trend as you go from low level to louder level. So then if we step into 86 decibels, we can see a pretty big increase in distortion in the bass region. And then if we go to 96 decibels, it's ramped up significantly. If we look at the multi-tone distortion, we pretty much know that this green line represents 96 decibels and we're stepping from 70, 78, and then 86 decibels. So according to the data, your best bet is to say somewhere between 78 and 86 decibels to keep the distortion low. This is for one speaker. So if you add another speaker, that's gonna add you six decibels for the, for the, for that almost sounded like a pirate, goodness. Um, when you add another speaker, you get the actual speaker surface area, but then you also double the power. So that's three decibels plus three decibels, and that's six decibels total. If you use a subwoofer and cross this dead at 80 hertz, it doesn't really change the distortion that much. And then if I look at long-term compression where I run 30 seconds worth of essentially pink noise into the speaker, we can see that I'm losing about seven decibels. So this goes up to here about seven decibels. So if I take my max minus seven, my max SPL is about 89 decibels. For instantaneous dynamic range, it's kind of the same thing. It's, it's roughly six decibels down at 96 decibels. So that's about 90 decibels. Between the distortion and the actual output maximum capability of the speaker, again, it points to a near field, lower to mid level listening situation. If you need something with a lot of dynamic range or you need to be further away from the speaker, then I would suggest you look into a larger monitor that has less compression and less distortion. The obvious question is, how does this Atom Audio compare to the Kali LP-UNF? They're both $299, but the Kali is a good bit larger, as you can see in this photo. There's a few other pretty strong differences. So for one, we're gonna look at just the on-axis response. The Kali is in red, the Atom is in blue. You'll notice the Cali has a bit more of a bass bump by about two to three decibels. That gives a little bit more punchy bass. However, it also means it's less linear through that region than the Atom. The Atom shows overall a little bit better linearity. In terms of distortion, if I just take the mid output volume of 86 decibels and we look at the Atom audio and then switch over to the Cali, we can see that the Cali's bass distortion is much less, but the Atom's is better in the mid range. And when I look at my compression results, the overall SPL capability between these two speakers is about two decibels or so. And it kind of depends on, are you talking about maximum long-term or are you talking about maximum instantaneous? But roughly the Cali gets to about two decibels higher than the Atom does. The other aspect that I want to look at is the radiation. So the Atom is about plus or minus 60 degrees. And then the Cali is about plus or minus 70 degrees. So the Cali is gonna sound a little bit wider. Additionally, the Atom has this tight window. Typical two ways have a pretty tight window vertically. 
Uh, but the Cali is a little bit wider, so it's a little bit more forgiving of vertical seating height. Both of them really need to be listened to directly on the tweeter axis, but with the Cali, you have just a little bit more wiggle room. So the main difference is here, and you probably knew this already, the Cali is a larger speaker, costs the same price, gets a little bit louder, not a whole lot louder, but a little bit louder, rolls off at about the same point, has a little bit more of a based boost, based boost, uh, but the Atom has better overall linearity and a few additional settings that the Cali doesn't have. Uh, between the two, you know, I like that the Atom performs as well as it does. It's smaller overall. If you want a little bit more bass boost and you want a little bit more SPL capability, then you'll need to go with the Cali. But the Atom is certainly no slouch, and I have no problem recommending this particular speaker. In fact, if I didn't already have these Callies, I would probably buy the Atoms just because they're smaller and they take up less desk space. So with that said, I want to thank Adam for sending this particular speaker out. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave them in the comments section below. If you'd like to support what I'm doing here, please join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, where you get some behind the scenes information. You get to vote for speakers that I'm reviewing. We get to talk. We can message. You can ask me consulting type questions, etc. Alternatively, if you'd like to help out without spending a dime more, just think of me next time you're going to go buy something from Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Target, Walmart, Newegg, et cetera, et cetera. I have all sorts of generic affiliate links in my description below. You just click on one of those links and you go buy whatever it is you need to buy. I earn a small commission off of that, and that allows me to keep doing what I'm doing here. This is not my day job, but extra money on the side is always nice because I can go get something a little bit nicer than, well, I can get Chick-fil-A for supper instead of just eating cereal. So that's cool, right? Maybe not as healthy. I don't know. You guys let me know. All right. I'll talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.